Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us. Welcome. Thank you for joining Data Mark on our webinar, Successful Grant Writing for Public Safety. My name is Sandy Dyer, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that we are recording this session for viewing at a later time. All attendees have been muted for quality assurance purposes, but we do encourage questions throughout the presentation, uh, either through the chat or, or Q&A panel um, as part of the Zoom, whatever you're more, more comfortable with. My team member, Stephanie, is co-moderating with me, and she and I will be monitoring for questions. Um, and we are encouraging questions throughout the presentation. So if you have one, don't hold on to it. Please use either the Q&A or the chat to go ahead and post your question to us. Um, just to give you a, a, to set the stage for today, we decided we wanted to handle today's webinar a, a little bit differently. Um, there's a great deal of information regarding grants and how to apply for grants with just a quick search on the internet. And knowing this, we thought we would provide a more for informative approach um, by having a discussion about grants. And that's what Jason and Bob are here today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose some questions to them to get the conversation started about grants uh, specifically, but really want to hear your questions about grants uh, so we can answer those um, concerns that you have either about applying for grants, I don't understand what this portion of the grant means, or how do I even get there? Uh, the panelists for today's discussion are Jason Bivens. Uh, Jason is our Datamark General Manager, and Bob Murphy, who is Datamark's Director of Business Development. I'll let them introduce themselves individually. Uh, Jason, do you want to start us off? Sure thing. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. I don't think it's good evening for anybody quite yet. Uh, my name is Jason Bivens. I am, as Sandy said, the general manager for Datamark, uh, which is the public safety division of Michael Baker International. And we're really happy to have you all here. Uh, my background, for those of you uh, that I haven't met before, is as a 9-1 director for the last decade before joining Michael Baker. So all of the things that we're going to be talking about today, I've had to work through myself and, and had to figure out uh, how to kind of weave through the many processes that it takes. So happy to join the conversation. Bob? And good afternoon, good morning, everybody. As uh, Sandy said, my name is Bob Murphy. I have the pleasure of being the Director of Business Development here for the Data Mark team. Like Jason, uh, I spent my my entire career in public safety, both as a as a field responder, as a 9-1 dispatcher, and most recently before joining the Data Mark team as a 9-1 communications chief in Okaloosa County, Florida. So uh, both operating in a, a large metropolitan PSAP in southwestern Pennsylvania and a, a smaller mid-sized PSAP here in Florida, uh, many of my my uh, my budgets were comprised of, of different grant funding. And um, so I have a lot of experience both applying for, managing, and sustaining some grant programs. And really our goal is to, to hear from you, see how we can help, and uh, just share with you some of the tricks and, and tips that we've used along our, our careers to help you achieve what you intend to achieve with your programs. Fantastic, thank you. And this is actually a question for the attendees today. What best identifies your role in your organization, whether you're a 911 public safety professional, a GIS professional, you might be a grant coordinator, although I'm not sure that uh, you would um, necessarily need our help if you are a grant coordinator, unless you're a new one, a procurement officer, a contracts manager, um, just pick the one that cl is closest to uh, the industry that you're in. You know, I think what's important for me when I was an I1 director was to kind of demystify the process and, and to understand it's not a difficult process and it's not uh, a process that you need to be really concerned about, but it's just one that you have to make sure you get all the, the grant requirements and you understand them and, and that way you can work through the process. Yeah, Jason, I think another thing all, along those lines from, from a grants perspective is in kind of setting the stage, looking around here right now, it looks like the majority of the folks on the call are GIS professionals. And that this may seem like an overwhelming task because traditionally um, you, you may not be, be looking to leverage grants to support your, 
your programs and initiatives. But there are a lot of folks in the community within your own counties, your own agencies that, that have experience with grants. Uh, and, and really a, a good opportunity for you is to reach across the aisle per se and talk to folks. Uh, a, a, and I will say a big help for me along the way that got me through that was, was working with our folks in emergency management. Uh, there are a lot of folks that, that, that operate and manage our EM divisions that in some cases, 80% of their operating budget is derived from grants. So they're really good at managing those and how to get through that. Um, and, and again, leverage your resources and um, hopefully we can help you with some of that today as well. Okay, one of the first questions that most folks wanna know is what types of grants are available out there? Um, whether or not they're GIS, public safety or 911 related. And um, today's discussion, we're really gonna keep it more towards the NG911, uh, GIS and public safety needs, but grants in general, what types of grants are available? Bob, can you help us with this? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, the one thing we've noticed as we look at this industry of, of public safety um, and NG911, as we said earlier, again, a lot of the emergency management organizations are, are, are wholly or part fu majorly funded by, by grants, but we're starting to see the shift occur in the NG911 world that Grants are coming available at, at state levels, at a federal level to support this transition. So you you have at your fingertips in most cases um, grants that can support anything from GIS services to infrastructure costs uh, to, to to special projects. You know maybe you have a CAD system upgrade, uh, text to nine one, as uh, implementation. Anything around, and really what I, the best way kind of describe it is what is that forklift change that's going to work, be required of, of your ecosystem to start a transition to NG911? Um, and the grants that are, that, that are available currently are designed just to do that. They're, help, they're there to help you take that leap from where you are today to position yourself in a trans, transitional environment to an NG911 uh, ecosystem. Then, as we'll talk a little bit later about sustaining that once you've made that forklift change. Um, one big thing a lot of folks say is I need more staffing. So how do I, how can I get somebody to subsidize my, my staffing requirements? And unfortunately, in a lot of cases with grants, typically you're, you're not going to get into a point where you're going to be able to line up grants for, uh, for direct staffing. I apologize, my dogs wanted to join us today. Um, so that's really, you know, think about that infrastructure, um, services, uh, anything other than direct staff. And I'd say also, Bob, you know, get creative, right? I think that it's not just 911 state boards uh, or, or emergency management organizations that are out there offering grants. We've seen um, in some states, you know, the library. Uh, state library. Uh, we've seen private organizations even that have offered public safety related grants to assist. So there's there's lots of ways to kind of skin the cat, if you will, and um, and hopefully we'll again help down that path today. Well, and when you think about next generation, I want to be a and uh, a, a portion of the of the system being a GIS based system for public safety folks. The challenge is trying to figure out. Um, where are those avenues of grants that I haven't historically looked for, right? I don't historically look for GIS type grants or, or grants that will support GIS simply because I, going back to what Bob was sharing, that wasn't a part of my ecosystem before, but now it, it will be a next generation I will want. And so expanding um, your knowledge on next generation I want and all those components and then expanding where to go find those grants um, is really going to help you to fund uh, what you need to get done. And on that, um, where can they find grants? And now, Jason and Bob, I did pull together some examples of some 91 public safety grants that, that are across the U.S., and I'll go ahead and move to that slide. But if you could perhaps talk a little bit about these grants and more specific, specifically if there is something unique about them, because every state or every community with their grants are going to have their own kind of built-in needs um, and perhaps some folks uh, on 
um, who are attending today are actually in these communities and aren't aware that these grants are here. So could you kind of uh, share where folks can find grants and if you have any information on these ones specifically? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll kick us off, um, and not necessarily in the order that you put them up there, but uh, I'm a Marylander. Uh, I was born and raised in Baltimore, so I'll start with Maryland because that's the one I know the best. Uh, you know, the one thing that I, I have really appreciated about the Maryland public safety system is that they really are forward thinking and they, they really set up a system in which uh, has offered the ability for 911 uh, directors to come on a monthly basis and put projects forward for approval. And so uh, they're able uh, in Maryland to not only get one-time funding, uh, but they're actually able to get some recurring funding uh, for certain types of grants up to five years currently. And that legislation was changed uh, late last year. So uh, again, Maryland's a great system, uh, very simple application process. It's a two page application where you have to just describe the project, you have to describe the procurement method that you plan on taking, um, and there's no uh, current limit on the amount of funding that you can request. And then uh, a couple others to just note, um, California uh, has a, a process in which each jurisdiction can request between $55,000 and $500,000 uh, from Cal OES uh, for GIS specific uh, public safety projects. Uh, and that's based on population. So that's a, a, another really easy process that, that California has made simple uh, so that you can get critical GIS funding, uh, which is important to point out, by the way. And I, I don't think we emphasize this enough as a public safety community. GIS should be at the forefront of any technology projects that you take on for NG911 because everything about NG911 is location focused. And so if you don't have good location data and you've not had the, the insight or the forethought to, to get that data quality up before you try to you know, implement new phone technologies, new CAD technologies that are all GIS driven, you're not going to get the full functionality out of those technologies that you could if you, if you had um, done GIS first. And then I'll, I'll mention one more and then I'll pass it over to Bob. Uh, Montana uh, State Library has a grant that, that is annual um, and that you can apply for. Uh, and that, they also do a, a three-year plan. So you, you, they kind of have a, some forethought into planning out what the next three years look like from an organizational perspective. Bob? Yeah, and, and you take the flow side of that. So Jason's taken uh, really, you know, you know, again, Maryland, and we've had a lot of folks um, come to us from other state agencies looking for creative ways to 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 advance their their either their funding models or their grant programs and quite honestly we've turned them on to you know review maryland and california's initiatives because they are they're they're, they're really uh i call them user-friendly initiatives that it makes it easier for the localities to move through the process to meet their needs um with a less restrictive uh with less restrictive program guidance but also meets, the, meets the, the overall initiatives and it has a fiscal responsibility to it. Um, but I, let's take a look at some other opportunities and I'll, I'm gonna take a, a step a little up further into uh, Kentucky there, excuse me. <clears throat> Kentucky now on services board has typically and historically offered one grant cycle per year available to their PSAPs to, to, to manage uh, anything regarding the legacy now on environment. Now, as they begin to transition to NG now one environment, they recognize there's a need there to go back through and support those, those PSAPs that are trying to do data services work. They're trying to transition their, their call hang equipment to, uh, to meet more of either the, the tech solutions or provide a redundancy. So they've opened up now their series to uh, two grant opportunities per year. Um, but looking back at the types of grants and some of the, 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 re the restrictions that are placed upon the, the programs, Kentucky is an opportunity where you have to be thinking about what you're going to need, you know, six to eight to 12 months down the road before you're in a position to, to start lining yourself up for the application where as Kentucky, for example, they require you to identify the, the program, figure out where it's going to fit inside their program initiatives and their funding priorities, but you also, before making an application, have to go out to some type of, of open and, and competitive procurement to procure those services. So they want to make sure you've done your homework 
that you have put your best foot forward, done your due diligence, you're being fiscally responsible with the services that you need before you go and apply for that competitive funding source. Um, and as we, we, we flip the other side of that, we look at, uh, and I'll talk about Alabama and Florida for, for an example, um, they're very similar. They have structured grant program cycles that, that open up. They will apply a funding priority depending on that grant cycle. So whatever the state's uh, initiatives are and in either that cycle or in the program management over, oversight, uh, they'll, they'll rank them by category. So you've got to make sure that your program is going to meet uh, the priority level based established by the, by the state. And that may be, for example, you know, Alabama is just coming outside of a, a, a grant cycle, cycle number five, it just was just awarded last month. And they're already looking to the next cycle to figure out when they're going to uh, initiate that and what that, that priority is going to look like. You know, Florida typically offers, you know, at least two, three uh, different grant programs per year. Uh, they're, they're under kind of a, a restructuring process currently right now, looking to see the best best way to move forward with uh, the grant programs so that they can, again, they can realign the programs to meet the needs of the counties and the entities that are relying on additional funding to go forward with that. Georgia, uh, you know, Georgia is another example that we're watching this one kind of grow um, as the system is, is developed, but, you know, Georgia has completely restructured their, their now on office. And as part of that, they're, they're pulling a subset of monies aside and they'll make those available um, to localities, and again, the same the same same piece holds true. There's there's going to be funding priorities and, and, and initiatives that align with the state's overall program. So you've got to be thinking. It's very important, I think, for all of these grants is to have in the back of your mind. Uh, make sure you've done the research and you know what that state's plan looks like. What are their initiatives that they're looking to accomplish in the next next 12 to 18 months or 24 months? because you want to align your project the best you can with the state initiatives so that you can show that you're doing your due diligence to move your program forward along with what the state initiatives are. Uh, that's going to, and we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, that's going to increase your probability of, of having a successful award. But I think the, the key component to all of these, these, these opportunities we have before you here is each of them are kind of tailored to meet the state's initiatives. Right, which coupled down to meet the unique challenges that, that, that maybe your program has. And Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'd say almost all, if not all of these that are listed here um, from a state perspective have really focused on GIS and CJS as a priority. Yeah, especially as we transition to this, this next generation now one world, right? I mean, I, the, the one thing that the states have all recognized and you look at the states that have begun to build out you know, statewide ESINET program, statewide uh, call routing solutions, They've all recognized in order to meet that, that, that truly transitional environment that it's going to take sometimes 18, 24 months, if not longer, in some cases, to get the GIS data to a point where it, it can support a geospatial call routing solution. So, you know, they've recognized it. They've made some funding available to, to support that initiative. It's just make sure we, again, we as consumers, and I say we as consumers because every one of us are a consumer to now one. Are, are being fiscally responsible with how we're, we're, we're moving these projects forward. You know, and I, both of you bring up a really good point. I mean, when I was with my state office, <clears throat> you know, we, we recognize that GIS um, and the development of GIS for an NG91 perspective was gonna take time. And when, at, as the state office decided we were gonna move forward with Next Generation 911, um, not only from an ESINET and a call handling solution, but we also decided we were going to start moving forward with our GIS as well, because we could do that in tandem. I can, the GIS community is a completely separate community, completely different stakeholders. Um, you do need champions that kind of sit in both areas that, to kind of cross pollinate the conversation, but it doesn't take all the same people to, to make both initiatives work. So then the GIS was at least um, competitive or ready by the time we were already deploying the ESINET, we were migrating to the new call handling solution, and then we were ready to start turning up our first 911 system or our first county on the call routing, right? Because the GIS was already ready. And, we, and part of our planning as part of NG911 was knowing that GIS was going to be a component of that and ensuring that our provider could support that. 
right? That it, we were providing a holistic solution. I think sometimes public safety, and I understand putting in ESINET and call handling solutions because a lot of times those are aging systems. We have to do something about them. And we think that the GIS will just have to wait. And that's not necessarily true because we could really be doing it in tandem and keep pace, right? So we're not constantly three, five, seven years behind in trying to get to engine 911. <clears throat> Okay, Steph, did we already launch this poll? I think we launched this one, didn't we? No? Yeah, we did. Yep. We did, okay. Yes, we did, then, Okay, um, then we'll go ahead and go past it. So um, th thank you if you already responded to the poll. Um, what we wanted now is kind of move into some common terms and questions regarding grants, right? So we haven't received any questions and we were prepared for that. Uh, so we went ahead and put together some questions that maybe you would have shared with us if if, uh, if you had known to come prepared with questions, right? So um, Jason, why don't you go ahead and lead us off with this one and is what are the key components of a grant proposal? Sure, I, I think first and foremost, you have to understand what you're asking for. So that story has to be there and, they, and you have to set the right urgency for the, for the project. Um, you also have to write the grant to the, the grant requirements and make sure that they're in alignment, especially uh, on the federal level. You, you know, there are key words that are, are, are looked at and evaluated. Uh, and if they're not met, uh, certainly will cause problems for applications. At the state level, uh, a lot of times the grant is much more about, like Bob indicated earlier, the priorities of the state. Uh, also, the you know, there is a finite amount of money that that any state has to issue uh, from a grant perspective. So those priorities are important and understanding how to tell the story to make sure that you set yourself up for success is extremely important. Um, I think we're gonna talk about this more at length a little later, but use your vendors, right? Use us to help you figure this out because uh, you might not be experts. You know, when I was a nine one director, I was certainly not uh, a GIS expert. And, and so I, I used my vendor community, I used my uh, GIS staff to help me build the story to really talk about the technical aspects of the need. Uh, the other thing is, again, make sure you are looking at what you have to provide. Uh, I know a big one uh, in many states is, are you following your, your local procurement laws and ordinances? And, and you have to identify how that's gonna be procured um, and some states require, you know, or have a limit of how much can be sole sourced, or you have to get three quotes, uh, or you have to go out to RFP. So those are really uh, some core components. Yeah, and, and to that, you know, JB, the one, th th really three other areas I, I think are, are critically important to the overall success of a grant that you put forward. And one thing to keep in mind is that, and as you said, there's a finite amount of money that is available during a grant program is typically competitive. So when a state grant program is initiative, if you have 70 counties in the state, you know, there's a high probability that you're, you know, 50% of those, those counties are gonna be applying. So you know, you're, you're going up against 34 of your peers in some cases, uh, vying for maybe a million and a half dollars available to, for everybody. Three key components, your, your need statement, okay? You're, when, when you're writing a need statement, this, as Jason said, this is your opportunity to tell the story, right? Um, you know, a lot of folks, and we think about this when we're talking about, you know, building resumes, and I think everybody on the call probably has built a resume at some point. The one thing that folks don't like to do is talk about yourself. They, 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 just, they just despise it. It's, it's hard to write about yourself. It's even harder to write about yourself and your program that you're, you're charged with leading and you have to identify a, a, a weakness uh, or expose a deficiency. There's a reason you're applying for grants. Okay, I'm not saying that you, you, you want to go from one extreme and make it look so bad that you should be operating, right? But you want to tell the story that I'm deficient here, but I've identified a solution to carry me forward. I just need somebody to help me with it. I need somebody to help fund all or portion of the program. The other side to that is um, the, the financial need, right? If you're like the states I've grown up in, Pennsylvania and Florida, um, the the surcharge on now one just simply cannot support overall operations of the PSAP. Um, additionally, you know, whether it be my county council or my board of county commissioners don't want to subsidize any more than, you know, typically 30% of my overall operating cost 
to manage the peace app yet i'm expected to provide the highest level of service to the folks who dial 91 so this is your opportunity to make sure that you take your needs statement and your in your, your needs justification tie that into why don't be afraid to share out very intimate details of your budget you know if you need to hold back x amount of dollars because you have a you have a a, a a call handling solution or you have a CAD solution that's kind of near its end and you're kind of limping it along, right? Uh, don't be afraid to say, look, I need to keep back 10% in, in, in the kitty in case something happens here. I have to plan for disaster. I have to plan for any of this stuff. Tell the whole story, right? Because the folks that are, that are, are really evaluating your grant are going to understand why you're writing what you're writing. You just, you just got to tie those back to, again, the grant initiatives, the state's, the state's plan, uh, and I think the third most important component of putting together a grant, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this on that when we talk about uh, some scope later, is you have to be able to clearly and tangibly identify and draw the, the shortest line to what the deliverable is. I'm asking for this. I can't afford it because of this, but here's what I'm going to get, right? And tie that back tangibly, make it as clearly and explicitly as possible so that the, the reviewer of that, art, that grant can, can draw all those connections, right? If you leave them a gray area, they're forced to make a make an assumption, right? And a lot of times there's not gonna be a back and forth, right? Your back and forth that you may go, uh, you may get to go back with the folks who are reviewing that, that grant opportunity may be in a limelight and you may not be prepared for that. So again, those I think are very th three very important areas for you to consider when you're putting together your grant proposal. Yeah, and Bob, you know, with the majority of uh, the attendees today being GIS professionals, a couple things to consider, you know, and we, we have clients that are very rural communities all the way to, to large metropolitan, very complex and mature GIS organizations. And it's, we've seen all of our clients, you know, need help, you know, no matter how mature your GIS system is, no matter uh, how many resources you have, getting the data quality of any data set to the public safety grade that's necessary for NG911 is a difficult task. And so don't be afraid to ask for help. GIS professionals, you know, get to know your 911 professionals and, and especially those that are in influencing positions. And don't be afraid to ask for help because I can tell you, I didn't not want to support GIS. I just didn't know I needed to support GIS as a 911 director. And so when that was brought to my attention and when uh, I had good conversation and I learned more about it, I, I then could be a strong advocate and influence decisions that were being made. So uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. And again, the vendor community, we're here to help you. We're here to support you. Um, you know, that's why we're in business. We try to, you know, especially what we've done is, is made really easy to use cloud native solutions that are, you know, uh, that deal with clients at every level. And, and, you know, a lot of you out there, uh, we, a lot of our clients have talked about the fact that they have a third shift supervisor or, you know, uh, a GIS person that's not a uh, formally educated professional GIS person, but has been trained along the way as like a work share kind of thing. So, you know, you have to look for solutions that are right for you and right again to Bob's point right to the need. Well, and not to belabor the conversation, but I know um, my experience is, is a lot of even bridging the conversation of I know you have public safety GIS to support CAD and to support the peace app and helping to understand the difference between that GIS and what we need GIS to do to actually support the 9 call. Because while we can start with the data that you already have, it wasn't necessarily built. Its intended use was not to support a, routing a 911 call. It was intended to help dispatch field units, right? So two different intended purposes and understanding that there's a difference. And at the end of the day, could you end up with the same data sets? Yes. Nine times out of 10, though, it's going to have to change a little bit because the intended purpose is different. Now, Bob, you talked about this a little bit. What type of expenses can grants be used to fund? I mean, because you had said, you know, consider what you need, consider your project, you're going to talk about your needs statement, you're going to, and we'll talk about scope of work in, a, in just a couple slides, but what actually could, what type of expenses could I actually use grant funds for? So, again, keeping this conversation specific around, I think, to tailor the conversation, 
uh, you know, we have GS professionals on, our, on the call, we have public safety professionals. So as we look at preparing your data for NG now, I wanted to support GS special car running solutions. I'll say 99.999%. So I'm gonna go back to that Nina five nines, right? If we look at the Nina five nines and compare that to the funding that's available, okay? You're, you're gonna have a, a, a grants that can support data maintenance, data creation, uh, data cleanup, um, conversion tools, uh, on-call GIS services, um, you know, consulting and strategic planning. So anything that you need to take your data from where it is today and begin the transition of get the data created, get the data, um, get the data normalized so they can support a geospatial uh, call running solution, those are available. And, and, and a lot of times if you go and you research the grant opportunity, you're gonna see in there, um, it's GIS services or GIS tools. Right. So, and the reason that you're, you're seeing it kind of that vague is because a lot of times when folks are putting together their grant priorities and the funding initiatives, they don't want to lockstep you in to a requirement that may not fit your need. So if, if County A only has a need to, to normalize data and to convert the data to the NEMA data model, then that's, the, that's their needs justification. But if you're another county that, um, you know, Maybe you're a rural county and you have you know, just under uh, 5,000 uh, population, right? You may be operating off of a CAD solution and, and, uh, and I'll use my previous county, I had 225,000 people in my county. Uh, we had a CAD solution, but we didn't have a CAD map. So our requirement for GIS data was very, very low. Now I had some base level GIS in my, in my call handling solution, but when it came down to creating GIS data, I was pretty much starting from the ground up. You know, so I didn't have the wherewithal. I didn't have a GIS person on staff. Uh, the county GIS team, um, they didn't have the, the intimate knowledge of the NINA standards. So I'll, there's funding available to go out and actually create that data from the ground up, um, maintenance, you know, perform maintenance on it. And again, uh, you know, going back to looking at budgets and such, you know, uh, in, in most cases, grants will allow you to, to to support services that can meet the need of, of the program. And where I'm getting at here is if you can't, if your budget cannot absorb um, through subsidized of, of, of maybe it's at home tax rates or maybe a hundred thousand dollar position to put in and hire one GIS person, you may be able to, to contract with on-call GIS services to, to handle that. Maybe it's eight hours a week, right? Because now you don't have somebody who is going to get redirected to handle, you know, maps uh, and do cartography stuff for, for somebody else in the county. Now you're working, you're contracting, de dedicated with a, with a GIS provider that will get in and grind for eight hours, get your data cleaned up, maintain your data. Um, and again, tools, you know, our, our, our cloud native solution, um, you know, you can fund all that on, 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 on your processes. But again, going all the way back to that is, uh, and there are also some cases, to be quite honest with you, there are some states that are allowing you to, to, to fund a GIS person. So if you're going to put a GIS person uh, and hire a, a full-time FTE position to support GIS for public safety, um, they'll, they will allow you to do that. Now, it gets tricky because you, you have to prove that that person is specifically working solely on public safety GIS, right? But it's important to kind of, you know, go back and you know, pull back the onion, you know, pull the layers of the onion back, look through the grant. Um, but most importantly, you know, I saw, I saw some contracts managers on here before, right? Uh, contract managers are really good at identifying the, the requirements of either A, the contract, or B, the grant program to make sure everything stays on track. Reach out and ask them a question. Say, hey, I, I, I want to do this. Is this permissible? But uh, in, in, in in general grant applications and general grant programs, uh, any any type of service, any type of uh, tools or software uh, to, to meet that that requirement will be applicable. And you know, not all cases. If you're looking to hire a couple of dispatchers, you typically won't find staffing money for for dispatchers, uh, fringe benefits costs, and so on and so forth for for leadership. But again. You reach out to those, those, those grant program managers and, and they'll be able to clarify for you directly or certainly reach out to us because again we've got a, jason and i and sandy are just three three members of the team um and we got gis practitioners that work with us and 
um, we're certainly experienced in looking at grants, so we're, we're happy to look at that for you as well. Right, because a lot of, you know, a lot of grants that we deal with in public safety are, come from local funds. So your state grant may be tied to legislatively how that money can actually be used. And so understanding the rules around the grant is important because um, you don't want it, obviously, to bring into question how those tax dollars were expended. So we did get a question, Bob, and it, they are asking, if it's possible, can you recap um, some of the important points of the key components of a grant proposal, like you had, uh, you know, you had explained initiatives or good data, that type of thing. Could you, could you kind of recap that conversation, sir? Yeah, absolutely. So, and again, going all the way back to, back to earlier, each grant application and, and grant proposal are, is going to be unique to the, to the program. But in every case, what you're going to have is you're going to have to identify a needs statement or a needs justification. So why do you need this, this grant? You know, what, either what plan are you gonna come into compliance with? What standard are you gonna meet? What is this, the, the state or the region's initiative that you're trying to accomplish and, and, and move forward with, right? So tie that back to something tangible. The second, the second component of that is the financial uh, need statement. Why can you not move the program forward without some financial assistance? Again, these, these two areas specifically are opportunities for you to, to kind of just cry your, you know, I hate to say it, but cry your heart out, right? You've got to tell folks, I've identified a deficiency and I've got a plan to move forward, but I need your help, okay? Um, and, how, and how I'm going to align that, that initiative with this, the state or region initiative. Um, and Lindy has asked about, you know, initiatives and good data. Yeah, you know, one of the biggest things that w w from an NG91 perspective is um, one, th one of the things that we all like to say is that our data is really good, right? And in most cases, your data is really good for the business processes that you're meeting today. And, you know, one of the hard things for all of us to swallow, because going back to this, we don't want to, we don't want to uh, identify our deficiencies or where we need to improve. But the NINA data model and the I-3 requirements to support geospatial car routing are completely different than anything else we're dealing with today. So it is absolutely okay to recognize the fact that our good data today is just not going to be good enough to support geospatial car routing solutions. So that's an opportunity to say, hey, I'm close. I'm just not there. So that is one of my needs. I can support my, my business systems today, but I cannot support a transition to NG-91. And Bob, you know, I, you know, this is my platform and, and I always take a, a time to offer this, but 98% synchronization is not good data. And, and so that was an informational document that came out from Nina and it was good information in combination with also looking at all the topological and spatial uh, validations that have to be run to, to, to evaluate your data. So, um, you know, it, for a long time, um, you know, we saw on grant applications the idea that I'm going to get to 98% synchronization in my MSAG in my alley, and and what we know uh, in 911 is our MSAG in a lot of cases is really not good data. We have massaged that and we have manipulated it to do the job that we needed it to do in a very legacy oriented system. And so now that we're moving into a spatially driven and, and very spatially oriented um, system, we, we can't just synchronize bad data because if you synchronize bad data to other data, you might just get questionable data. And so just some, something to consider. Um, and there was another question, uh, you know, are there grants that allow outsourcing as part of the data creation job? Yes, uh, almost all of our clients, uh, that's their primary focus is for us to help them um, not only remediate data through our, our uh, software solution, but then also help them create the data that they don't have or uh, help remediate some of the other data sets that need that help. Um, all of our clients, not all of our clients, a good number of our clients also use us to help them with ongoing maintenance because especially in um, communities that have not a lot of GIS resourcing, um, can't afford um, enterprise-based uh, solutions to help them, you know, we offer a very user-friendly solution. And so 
a lot of our clients use us for a whole multitude uh, of services, both uh, one time and ongoing. And I think the important thing to think about with that, uh, no matter no matter who you use or or, or what what your your project looks like is to make sure that you're getting good information at the end of it and and challenge if you don't think that the the work product that you're getting is to the point that is what you expect it or what wasn't in the scope of work uh, that you put into your grant application make sure you push back because you know we really take a lot of pride ourselves in good quality data at the end of a project and, and ongoing. And so make sure that's what you're getting. Fantastic. Sorry, Sandy. Appreciate the question, folks. No, you're all good. Um, we only have about 15 minutes left, so I'm gonna, sc I'm gonna skip through um, the budget cycle one, but just folks remember that when you're looking, there are different budget cycles for different grants. Um, some uh, grant applications will be looked at every other month. Some will be, you get one shot per year. Uh, federal grants are gonna be on a federal uh, fiscal year cycle versus your state cycle, which might be different, but just be mindful of the budget cycle. The reason you need to be uh, mindful is one, um, what are the reporting requirements? When is it gonna close? When do I need to make sure all my work's done so I can complete my reporting requirements? Those types of things are gonna fall, um, are gonna complicate your budget cycle if you're not, if you confuse your budget cycle with a grant budget cycle, it may end up catching up with you. JB, why don't you go ahead and launch us off on this one? I'm sorry, Jason, <laughs> sorry. Um, there's a lot of grants out there that are a reimbursement grant and folks are really kind of reluctant to go into a reimbursement grant, which could you kind of talk about that a little bit? Sure. First of all, don't be afraid. It's all, it's going to be okay. Um, reimbursement grants are scary uh, for a lot of folks because they feel like they have to have the funding um, not only identified, but available. And in the world that we live in, it's really about the budget. And if you can identify a budget line item, that you could use the money from if necessary, the reimbursement becomes really easy because it's a, it's a process game. You, as long as you can get the invoice in and get it to the state for reimbursement in advance of having to pay uh, the vendor uh, for the services or software, then you really can um, not ever need to worry about the budget, the actual budget inside your agency or organization. Um, also, you know, Reimbursements have gotten a lot easier uh, and, and states have identified uh, the need to, to be flexible uh, and to pay in a timely fashion, uh, you know, reimburse in a timely fashion to the local jurisdictions because of, of that. And, and with the priorities that have been established, uh, it, can, it, can get, uh, it can be scary and it can get um, nerve wracking to have to monitor it. But if you're diligent about it, uh, you know, you'll be able to, to work through it in a, a very easy fashion. Fantastic. And kind of along the same lines, Bob, um, a lot of grants either are looking for matching funds or we'll call it a cost match. And sometimes you act, that actually has to be like actual cash match, um, C-A-S-H, cash match, or it can be in kind. Um, can you explain to us what these terms mean and then uh, can I use in-kind to meet a cost match requirement? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, taking the first piece of that is the, the cost match or, you know, local match. Uh, I think everybody on the call is, is, is probably familiar with the federal engine I one grant. That's a, a classic example where the federal government um, is going to provide, you know, 60% of the overall program where the locals, and I say locals, I mean locals by the recipient, which of the states have to contribute 40%. So if the overall program or the overall grant that the state applied for was $100 million, then the federal government will pay $60 million and the state has come up with $40 million. Uh, there are a lot of grants that uh, will have a cost match and, 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 and really not to get too too detailed in interest time is it's not to, to deter you from applying for the grant right but it's trying to take the limited amount of dollars and spread that across the program so that everybody gets a portion of that 
right? But also it helps the state see that you're invested and you're not just looking for a handout, right? That you, you can pay for a portion of it and it's typically 10, 15, maybe 20%. Um, they're looking for you to invest in that from a cost perspective. But again, it helps stretch the, the, the dollars of, to, to other, other entities who are, who are seeking um, grant funds, shows your commitment to the program. The other, the other side are in-kind matches or in-kind in um, contributions. So, you know, these are one of those ones where you have to, you have to look deep and, and not every grant will, will allow an in-kind uh, contribution or an in-kind match. But if you are permitted and there's a provision in a grant for an in-kind match, then these are things, you know, for example, if uh, I'm going to go out and go all the way back to the, the one question about um, data creation. Can I get a portion of the grant to provide data creation? Yeah, absolutely. If, you're, if your overall need is data creation, and then uh, the second portion of your need to, to transition to NGNI1 is, um, is, 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 let's say it's placing address points over the, the site structure, right? If you're, the overall project is uh, address point placement and data creation for road center lines, you're gonna outsource the, or hire a contractor to handle your road center line creation. Um, but your staff or your just department staff or some other, some other staff is gonna complete the address point placement work in house. Then as long as you're tracking those hours and you, you're willing to identify and commit X number of hours, which equate to X number of dollars, then that can be shown as an in-kind contribution to the grant. And in, in some cases, and, and actually we're starting to see a little bit more increase in this, uh, that can be used as, as part of your, your cost match requirement. So, you know, again, whether it's, you know, if it's a public safety entity, uh, I'm gonna reach over to the GIS folks and say, hey, I've got this program, I need help. I can only get, get, get funding for X percentage of it, but I can use an in-kind in um, contribution to meet my match. Are you willing, do you have the bandwidth and can you commit to doing X amount of work, um, you know, which equates to X number of dollars, whatever that requirement may be. Um, and a lot of times that will get you through that. So, but it's very, very important that your documentation and your record keeping when you're doing any type of in-kind match or in-kind contribution um, is, is on point. And those, those folks on the call who are, grant, are, are uh, contracts managers, you understand just how, how important that is. You have to show that tangible deliverable of what what was accomplished and what was the effort and the financial value that it took to accomplish that. Right, and there is a slide coming up about scope of work, but that goes back to the scope of work, right? When I'm planning out my grant, what is gonna be my scope of work? And so say like, so we have the address comparison evaluation um, solution, right? Where we'll compare five different address databases and we'll come up with candidates of of addresses that are missing in your address point layer. Well, you may decide, hey, we want to do your A solution, but we'll place our own address points. And that could be the in-kind portion of it. As you're thinking through, when I apply for this grant, what work do I need done? What can I do versus what am I gonna ask someone to help me with, that type of thing. This kind of goes into um, also though a sustainability plan, right? Because Bob, you kind of talked about this. Um, what is, a lot of grant applications ask for it. What is a sustainability plan and why is it important? Yeah, so going all the way back to the investment, right? If you're asking for a, a, a grant to support a transition to NG91 GIS, it's, it's not gonna be a, a, a small grant. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think you have to be realistic and, and say, that, that, you could be asking for anywhere between, you know, 150,000 in some cases to a half a million dollars to get your data in a position to support geospatial car routing. So if the grant body and the governing, the governing body that's going to uh, award that grant to you is willing to, to, to meet you in the middle there and provide that funding, they want to know that you have a plan to carry that forward as everybody on this call knows the minute you make a change to GIS data and you publish that GIS data, there's something else that has to be maintained. Something changed, a new development was up, an address has changed, a road center line was extended, uh, they put a new subdivision in, it's constantly changing. So 
your sustainability plan is you have to identify what is your plan to carry this project forward so it doesn't just die off it's not a one and done right you have to explicitly identify what that plan looks like now that plan may may include having to build in ftes over time all right and, and getting those programs into budgets down the road to order to sustain that um but in a lot of cases again the sustainability plan in a lot of and, and again in a, a lot more grants more recently is What's your plan to maintain it? I can't just hand it to you one time and expect it to be there. Um, and you, you have to show us how you're going to do it. Uh, your grant reporting is one thing we haven't covered here before uh, on, on this conversation as well. But you know, with grant reports, you're going to have to show tangible, again, to come back to the tangible deliverables, this is what you did. This is how you did it, right? And show us exactly. You, know, you may be asked to provide a report a third party report or, or, or some type of other um, realistic output to say, this is where the data was, and this is where it is, and this is where it's going to be, and you have to meet those benchmarks along the way. If not, then you haven't met the, the requirements of the, of, the, of the grant or the contract program. Right, and GIS for Next Generation 911, I mean, it becomes your 911 network, so it's not a one and done. I mean, obviously, when it becomes a life saving component of what we do, it has to be maintained. Now, so Jason, Bob had mentioned, you know, that you need to plan out your grant. I mean, some GIS projects between 150 and half a million dollars. Um, how does someone determine how much grant money they need for their application? Yeah, absolutely. And this goes back to use your vendor community, you know, call us, ask us to help you build that scope of work out, which I think is the next slide, but we can probably talk about together because I think they go hand in hand. Uh, in order to really understand what, uh, how much it's going to cost, we have to understand what does the project look like. And so, uh, you know, we have uh, many, many times over not only helped uh, clients build a scope of work custom to what they need in their particular jurisdiction, but then also help them build a cost plan. And, and in some cases, even did the grant writing for them. So it made it easier, uh, you know, kind of the easy button, if you will, uh, to submit. And, and that's not to say that, um, that you could not do this on your own, but it would be much easier, uh, especially if you do plan on outsourcing um, your GIS work, to let us help you build that uh, scope of work and let us help you give, give some perspective on how much it's going to cost both um, in the one time and potentially on the, on the, outs, uh, on the outside, how ongoing costs. Right, and we can even help you figure out if, if you know that there's limited dollars to your grants, like you mentioned in the California one, it's between 50,000 and 500,000, depending on population, we can help figure out what you can get done within the grant that you're able to apply for. Absolutely. And a lot of these grant cycles are, are you can keep going back and apply either quarter to quarter, month to month, year to year. And so uh, we could build a plan that allows for a multi phase project. And that's what I used to do is we would plan it out in phases, knowing, you know, I had so, so many dollars this time. Next time we'll catch it up this. But we the value was we were building upon work that had already been completed. And so in there, um, there were some cost savings, right? I wasn't, we weren't re-educating every time we were moving into a new phase of the project because when you have to re-educate that, that cost, that cost dollars. Um, now a portion, cause I do want to get into this last section. Cause I know that a lot of folks struggle with this and Jason, if you can continue the conversation again about, um, those procurement solutions, I know at the beginning of my grant, I should be thinking about, do I even have, if I get awarded, do I have a way to even get the services and solutions I'm looking for? But sometimes I don't think about that. If you could talk about the different types of procurement solutions out there just to educate folks. Yeah, I think this is uh, probably of the grant process. This is the scariest part uh, and can be the most frustrating. Uh, and if you don't think about it early, you know, it, it makes the, the whole process a little harder because you have to really understand your local procurement rules, ordinances, laws. You have to understand the grants um, procurement uh, uh, rules, if there are any, and, and kind of figure out what's the best path for you. Uh, 
And these are really good examples. And I'm going to touch on almost all of them because I think it's, it's super important. Sole source is obviously the easiest. If you have flexible procurement uh, rules and you can sole source to get the custom work, that the specific application software that you want uh, that's user friendly, then that's a great easy solution. Um, and if you want to sole source, but need to find a, a good way to do it, you can use cooperative purchasing agreements like HGAC um, out of Houston Gaveston. You can use um, uh, state uh, contracts like uh, the California CMAS uh, agreement. Um, and here are some listed uh, just so that y'all can can kind of see some of the options. And these are all ones that we're on uh, and, and can certainly be bought off. Uh, the one in Oklahoma, uh, we talk about piggybacking. The idea of piggybacking uh, isn't uh, commonly known, but what can happen is if, if, for example, in Oklahoma, this was a competitively bid uh, awarded contract. And so uh, because it was competitively bid and a lot of procurement rules allow for you not to have to go out and re-procure it yourselves, because the whole process of procurement and, and RFPs is expensive. It's expensive for, for your jurisdiction. It's expensive for the vendors. And so if you can access services and software from a already competitively bid uh, contract, then that makes it really simple for you. Uh, the GSA is a really good example because that usually you get really competitive pricing off of. Um, and, and there are a lot of requirements around how vendors need to price uh, going on into the GSA. So that uh, is a good one. Um, Sandy, can you go back for one second? I, I want to make sure I hit some of the important ones. Uh, hit the master service agreement, multi-award schedules. So a lot of times that, that could be your GSA where there's a multitude of awards uh, that are available. Uh, limited bids. So you might not have to go out to a full request for proposal process, but maybe just get three bids. Uh, instead of a, a full process. And then finally, probably the most uh, costly and, and uh, complex is the RFP process where you have to have a formal uh, announcement. There has to be a period of time that you're receiving proposals. You have to evaluate those proposals in a, in a specific way. Um, and it can lead to lots of hurdles like protests. Uh, if you don't follow the, the RFP process as you've outlined it, uh, it can cause you problems procuring uh, ultimately uh, and we saw a lot of clients, um, not a lot, we've, we've seen clients that have had to pull back their entire process simply because there was a procedural error. So just some things to think about. And we're happy, uh, I know that we're getting rushed toward the end here, but we're happy to talk offline about any of these topics. Uh, I know Bob shared his email in the chat uh, and we're happy to, to help you through those problems or questions. And we did, because we're at the top of the hour. Um, really appreciate the questions that we did receive. If there was something we didn't answer for you, please reach out to us um, either through the email addresses, Jason, if you wouldn't mind dropping yours into the chat as well, or just even uh, by contacting Datamark uh, at datamarkgis.com. Uh, we're happy to, to go ahead and respond and reach out to you as well. Everyone have a very very fantastic day have a merry christmas because i'm sure i won't see you by then and jason and bob thank you so much for uh participating in the webinar today thanks for coming thanks everybody be well